on the water, Internet of Things has a lot of applications. As you can see, um, one of these uh, picture uh, is actually from recreation the filming. And I'm not sure how many of you can actually have uh, watched the video movie. My Octopus teachers, they use cameras on the water and try to film. Uh, so there's a lot of data that needs to be transferred. But uh, in that case, they actually try to use the film and save the data and then uh, uh, retrieve the uh, camera later on and then edit for them, right? Um, in, uh, in addition to recreation and filming, there's infrastructure monitoring. Oil and gas industry is uh, a, a heavy user of on the water Internet of Things. Uh, energy harvesting offshore, um, uh, wind farms, and uh, wave energy harvesting, um, as well as the fishery and aquaculture, boating, shipping, and, and uh, uh, ocean exploration itself. Uh, so many people know that the ocean takes up 70% of uh, the Earth's surface. And uh, since 1982, um, the United Nations actually uh, defined this EEZ zone, they call it uh, ex exclusive economic zone, which is 200 mile, nautical miles uh, from the shore. And uh, United States actually started uh, recognizing this uh, convention uh, at, du during uh, Donald Trump's uh, presidency. So, um, all the countries can actually use 200 nautical miles. Um, so this map really shows uh, how many of these blue, dark blue areas that th these countries can actually use to develop their uh, economics. Uh, 2021, it was actually a new decade of uh, uh, ocean, ocean science and development. Um, uh, from UN, so there's also a lot of activities, investment from from uh, different countries. Um, so what is uh, what is the uh, IoT devices that we are talking about? Really, um, including all these human activities in in those ocean areas, uh, they're human operated vehicles. Uh, they are always remotely operated vehicles. Normally, they are tethered, meaning you have a big big cable uh, supplying power as well as communication means. And there's AUVs, um, autonomous underwater vehicles. Those are non untethered, meaning that you have to power yourself and try to use wireless means to uh, communicate or connecting to internet uh, through water and then through air. Um, underwater gliders, there's quite a lot of uh, uh, those devices uh, uh, available, they normally don't have very strong engine. They use the uh, buoyancy system to uh, drop down and pump up and, and very long-term uh, missions uh, around the ocean. Uh, drifters and floats uh, is more of this uh, idea of smaller devices and uh, uh, also a lot of them. So more assembles this underwater uh, internet things. Uh, of course, there's also a lot of marine robotics and hybrid drones. I show one of these here. Uh, I'm not sure if I can uh, copy this uh, link. Uh, 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 you may be able to actually watch the video by yourself. And uh, I recently collaborated with them that the, the drone can actually fly out in the air and drop in the water and then also fly from the water out to the to the air. So you can imagine that uh, flying in the air normally is a lot faster than, than uh, swimming in the water. So um, here is a map. Again, you can also take this website and, and check today's uh, floats, uh, how many of them are there and, and what their location. Uh, so for those floats, they are uh, the, the, the longer ones, they're about a, a meter or a meter and a half in height. 
um, you they have actually the antenna on the top, so they they are popping up and down, and then when they are actually accessing out of the water, they transmit data out to the satellites, and then uh, satellite servers actually send data to the to the internet. Uh, there's a smaller version, as you can see down to the uh, corner. Uh, uh, they're kind of uh, a, a little bit bigger than the basketball. And again, they also have the uh, antenna that uh, goes RF communication uh, and send data to the, to the internet. Uh, so again, every year there's about 4,000 of them and, and uh, they're, they're just floating around and uh, sensing the world uh, oceans and and some of them die. I was told that uh, the ten percent of replacement. So uh, any country, any uh, anybody would like to actually um, build one of these, they actually support uh, those kind of things. So that's a very uh, another uh, underwater uh, internet things. Application is actually inland in the water uh, of uh, rivers and, and, and under bridges. Uh, so this is one of the work that uh, um, my student and I did. Uh, I also presented in WoofNet uh, that year. Dr. Achkiades actually was um, a judge on the student uh, demonstration and we won the first prize. So the idea is actually using the coil and uh, electronics and sensors, put it inside a big rock and uh, acting as a, as a rock uh, underneath the bridge and, and try to sense how a bridge skull uh, is developing over the years. And so again, my expertise is really underwater wireless communication and uh, uh, I always show these slides because we have three physical means of doing underwater wireless communication. Uh, mostly the RF will not work, uh, your cell phone will not work underneath the water. Um, so the uh, common means is acoustics, which is the ultrasound. And another one is the EM uh, radio or the uh, IM communication, which, which is the one that I show over here using the coils. Uh, as a near field kind of application. Another one is the optical, which use the uh, near blue lights uh, in order. The distance is short, but the bandwidth is high and acoustic is actually commonly used with a lot of long-term, long, -term, long uh, distance communications. So my work really is to try to target uh, using some kind of means to, to uh, achieve good range as well as good uh, uh, data rate. So that is really a lot of needs over this area of performance. Um, so my past um, research experience really is on a lot of acoustic communications. And I show some of these turbo equalizers performance over here. We did uh, MIMO, which basically means that we use a lot of transmitters transmitting at the same time uh, so that uh, we can improve the bandwidth, uh, but still uh, keep the distance as well as um, we design a lot of uh, turbo equalization algorithms that uh, reduce the uh, bit error rate or the, the re uh, increase the reliability. Uh, through our advanced algorithms. Um, so this uh, 2015 uh, Kamsak magazine paper really summarized most the essence of the uh, turbo equalizer, uh, decision feedback turbo equalizer uh, work and, and their performance. So today I'm, I'm actually not trying to talk about my old uh, research uh, topics, although th those are most familiar and uh, we are actually using uh, hardware to, to implement our algorithms right now. Um, but I think uh, the, 
the other topic, which is the PNL fish tag detection is probably a, a lot more interesting in the research aspect. So what is a fish tag? Uh, PNL is actually a research institute uh, in Washington state, um, about uh, three, two, two, two hours from uh, Seattle. So they, a group of uh, hydrologists, um, basically civil engineer people, uh, they actually de develop a series of fish tag, which is very small, and they inject this fish tag into the salmon fish. Now, the picture shows on the tummy, but in fact, they actually inject around the, um, the back uh, of, of the fish, which has a lot more muscles around here. So they um, inject this little fish tag in there, and then the fish will swim around and and send, uh, send the, the tag IDs and, and the information around. So the receiver are mounted around the um, hydro dams and, and along the river, uh, many, many of those receivers, and they keep recording all these fish tag signals. So they record all year round. Uh, so you can imagine there's a lot of data. And uh, the, the fish tag itself is very small. As you can see, diameter is uh, uh, a lot smaller than a fin finger and, and communication range is about 150 meters, which is not very far, but it's enough to reach uh, most of these um, uh, receivers as they swim by. Um, yeah, only you need the, the width of the river to, to reach, right? And, they're using a very high density battery to actually power it, uh, very small as well. I have a sample over here, if you can see the camera. Uh, so this is one of the smallest one. And the one that I'm showing in the slide is actually a bigger one. Uh, so there's a sequence of uh, their, their developed sensors, as you can see. Um, the one that I'm holding is the one up here, ear tag that is only like two uh, little rice grain lengths, okay? And this, this little thing can actually transmit nonstop for, um, for 50 days. Um, of course, there's also other uh, uh, sensor fish also developed by the same group. So in 2018, this group actually found me and say, um, we have this fish tag that transmit to this these very short messages. And uh, the signals that we receive quite often are very strong, but uh, for some reason, we cannot really detect the tag code correctly. Um, we know you're experts in, in this area. Can you help, can help us to look into this and see how we can improve the detection? So uh, I visited them and I got a, a small grant uh, uh, working with them. And at that time, I was trying to transfer from Missouri to Lehigh. So over that summer, I worked on that. I, I, I did not have student uh, transferring from Missouri to Lehigh. So I worked on it by myself uh, for a couple of months uh, during the summer. So the details of this tag really is uh, the transmitting at a, a pretty high frequency, as you can see, uh, 400 some kilohertz, which is a lot higher than the, uh, the common uh, acoustic modem. So they suffer a lot more on the um, Doppler frequency and data rate is also pretty high. Uh, they're using BPSK modulation and the tag really transmits seven bit bucket code as a, as a known code and preamble. And then 16 bits, uh, tag ID and then followed by eight bits CRC, um, circular um, cyclic uh, uh, redundancy check uh, codes. And the tag will transmit for uh, 744 milliseconds and then wait a, uh, a few seconds and then transmit again, and repeat over and over until the battery dies. Okay. Uh, so this is a very short code, very, similar to those IoT device uh, 
a transmission very short uh, packets. So this is some of our received signal, uh, as you can see over here. Uh, the, the, the files are actually recorded like uh, uh, 40,000 samples every file. So they actually, they record all the time, but they divide the recording for this, this, uh, this length, um, 40,000 uh, samples. And, and then they continue with like, time samples with the files and all that. So each recording folder probably contains uh, 3,000 to 6,000 files and things like that. And one of the file looks like they have some echoes from other tag and then silence and then uh, uh, one tag here, another tag coming in, which appears to be different fish, uh, fish tag that comes in. And for this one, it's lucky that the, the first one was transmitted finished and then the second one actually comes in and then there's some other tag and chopped by uh, the file system itself. And this, this one is another one that's actually um, tested in the water tank. So they transmit a little bit closer to each other. Uh, the same tag, they know the tag uh, ID itself, but uh, you see this uh, echoes coming in after half of the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the transmission is halfway through and then they have echoes and very strong signal that's clipped like this, okay. Uh, so the signals are very bad, okay. Uh, okay. Um, so another one is this very, very much low, pretty low signal to noise ratio, a lot of different echoes. And, and uh, if you zoom in into or amplify this signal, you can see some of these uh, waveform resembles this fish tag, but uh, very messed up. Okay. So those are the data that we are getting and uh, trying to detect if there's a uh, fish tag code in there. So the challenging with this particular problem is uh, um, the carrier synchronization is pretty difficult. Uh, the, the fish, although they're not swimming so fast, but uh, the river quite often runs uh, at a, a certain speed, uh, uh, sometimes higher, sometimes lower, but uh, if we take one meter per second flow rate, that's equivalent to like 280 hertz of uh, Doppler. And so that's Doppler also changes often. So you need to really compensate for this Doppler. Uh, frame synchronization is also difficult. Uh, normally people use this buffer code to make sure this, this uh, data frame starts um, at certain place, mm. with this one, it's really difficult to say which one actually start the frame. Um, uh, uh, one thing that uh, is difficult with the seven bit buffer code, too short, and uh, you have very strong correlation with other seven bit patterns. As you can see down here, you have quite a few that's, uh, that's very high 0.7. Um, so normally people use very long uh, M sequence, a hundred some bits or 265 bits, 56 bits, uh, 256 bits and things like that, which give you a very sharp uh, autocorrelation. And, but this one is not as, as good. Um, so the CRC code is only okay or good to detect three bits errors but it's very difficult to really do uh, error correction and only one bit can be corrected. So if you have the code that's detected in error, the error correction capability is only one bit, uh, which is, of course you can, you, you also see the uh, multipass uh, echoes are also very, very strong and uh, uh, difficult to, to, to do equalization. But at that time I feel like, okay, I'm expert in uh, equalizer. I got my uh, 
uh, work recognized by IEEE fellowship and the fellow uh, as, as an equalizer person, uh, I might just get in uh, the, the area and do something on the equalizer side and try to help. Um, so this is when we try to try to do the equalization uh, or detecting the the frames to that and then try to demodulate it. And this is how you see there's a lot of peaks over here and run detection of the peak. For this first one that's clean, you have a very clear first peak that you actually identify the start of the frame. But for the, the ones with echo, it's already messed up with your uh, correlation and the first peak is not the correct the, it should be the correct one, but uh, the second pick is a lot higher. So that gets you uh, a run location of your starting point. Uh, it should start from here, but uh, it actually, the detection gets you to start over here. Uh, so another thing is when you have, similarly, when the peak shows up, it actually is due to the, due to the echoes. Um, the challenge in the channel equalization and uh, 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 channel estimation is uh, this case, as you can see. Normally, if we have the echoes as close together, uh, we, we show two, two different echoes over here, uh, then we can use this seven bit buckle code to really estimate the, the channel uh, impulse response. Um, but uh, in our case, the echo actually comes in very late after my pilot has already finished transmission and the first echo come in uh, into this data this time and then another echo come in even later. So your pilots really cannot estimate this particular echo uh, or even the later echoes. So the channel estimation itself becomes very difficult. Uh, so the whole um, problem really is the echo can come in in any of these 31 bit duration, but you only have seven bits. So you're actually trying to solve a problem with 31 equations, but only seven, uh, 31 um, coefficients, but only seven equations to, uh, to do the uh, channel estimation. So this is a very strong ear conditioned uh, underdetermined system, basically. Uh, so I show some of these uh, uh, e the block diagrams, very detailed block diagrams in, in the receiver side. Um, so um, after I actually worked on this over the summer, also I had another student work on this for another uh, half year when I was in Lehigh. I recognize this problem that's not a conventional uh, uh, equalizer or channel estimation can actually toggle this problem. And, uh, and that becomes a difficult problem now. So I, I asked Susan, uh, one of our uh, PhD students who is really, really strong in optimization and communication and to look into this problem and he actually come up with very, very nice uh, uh, algorithms. So here we are trying to discuss those algorithms now. Uh, a little bit of detail of this baseband channel uh, transceiver uh, system model. So when we transmit, we say that the, the transmit symbol is X. Now in our case, we basically transmit pilot, ID code, and then CRC, they are all BPSK modulated. So they take values of plus one and minus one uh, in the baseband. And then this is the channel channel itself. When you do D, after you do demodulation of carrier, the channel uh, is, is a complex um, channel coefficient. And again, we only need to uh, worry about the 31 bits. So, um, we can say that the channel length, it would be, channel length L would be 31 in this case. And N is the noise, Y of course also is a complex a baseband uh, uh, received signal. So uh, the pilot itself has MP uh, bits, basically uh, in our case is seven. Now, 
as you can see that uh, um, because we don't really know uh, the age, we also don't know a lot of the X. We only know seven bits and the ID 16 bits is unknown. So quite often you have this convolution that can have many different combinations of H and the X to really yield uh, the Y, especially you don't, uh, you also have uh, noise over there that you don't know. So there's many, many combinations that you might actually yield the same Y. Um, so is this problem actually a, a, a unique or a solvable? Um, so uh, Susan went in and uh, uh, did uh, some theoretical analysis and say, okay, it is identifiable uh, under those conditions. Uh, so the first condition is no noise. And in practice, we basically say high SNR. Uh, if you have very good uh, SNR, then it should be identifiable. And another one is you have at least one pilot bit. So we have seven, which is uh, way beyond the expectation. And there are also some probability measure function that uh, needs to be satisfied. Uh, again, what is the uh, practical uh, implementation of this? Um, I don't know, but uh, uh, most likely we have this condition actually met. So this gives us pretty good uh, um, uh, confidence that uh, this can be solved. So um, the possible solutions that uh, uh, Susan actually looked into, including the uh, maximum likelihood method, which basically is uh, taking the 16 bits and do a proof for search and say which one is giving me the best uh, likelihood uh, function. But this approach is too high of a complexity because you have to search uh, two to the 16th combination of those beats, right? Um, uh, and the blind equalization uh, method is not quite suitable because um, uh, blind equalization CMA algorithm needs really, really long data, data blocks. And this data block is really small, it's just 31 bits. So Susan come up with a couple of algorithms. Uh, algorithm one is using uh, this minimization uh, method, uh, which is actually an uh, L2 norm uh, with uh, the uh, arrows of the um, received signal, as well as what you guessed of the X come off with H. Uh, subject to this H being uh, sparse, meaning that uh, the L1 norm of H is very small. And uh, also we have the constraints of the XD, which is the uh, uh, tag ID code, uh, taking the value from plus one and the minus one. And, and of course the original uh, constraint would be taking only the value minus one and the plus one, and Susan made it to relax into taking the value between minus one to plus one. So in the range here, um, this relaxation makes the problem easier to solve. And uh, it's also guaranteed that uh, uh, when you have uh, the, the sparseness constraint over here, the solution is actually on the extreme of this, this uh, uh, feasible set of the XD. Um, so this is very similar to those comprehensive sensing approach. You have a L2 norm optimization uh, a cost function with some constraints uh, of L1 norm. And the solution was published in WCNC 2020. And the uh, complexity is a little bit higher than the uh, algorithm two. So Let's also look into the algorithm two here, improved version. Um, instead of using L2 norm, it actually uses the L4 norm. Um, but the formula of this inside, the, um, the metric here, becomes uh, a Y times X, and Y is a big matrix, actually uh, consists of all these received symbols in here. Um, just pile them up into this, this matrix. 
So you don't really see the H in any place um, because H is not required to be explicitly solved. Um, once you have the X sub D uh, searched uh, or, or determined, the H uh, can be uh, can be just uh, solved correspondingly. Again, um, the X of sub D also takes this uh, range and the um, solution, again, the convex set, feasible set of the X gives you the extreme end of, of the solution. So it's the same as taking the constraint of either plus one or minus one. Okay, so this this uh, work is published in the journal of IoT, actually journal of IoT, um, twenty twenty. So let's also look into the a uh, little bit detail of this and, and what is the reason to choose y times x? Um, this particular um, solution really is a uh, autocorrelation of the, the the system the the transmitted symbol. Uh, convolve with the H itself. And as you can see, one of the example over here, the, the autocorrelation of the X makes it a lot sparser. Um, the the autocorrelation at zero point is a lot higher. And that convolve with the H also makes the whole thing a lot sparser. Um, the channel impulse response is, is in the middle and then the uh, uh, y times x, the uh, magnitude of those is also sparse. So once you specify uh, the whole thing, then the um, uh, searching for the sparse solution is a, a lot easier. Um, uh, then, uh, so, so we only have seven bits of the, of the uh, pilot. So we try to find the sparse solution over here. Um, another improvement uh, for this algorithm is uh, uh, Susan actually de uh, designed uh, uh, initialization um, method, um, meaning to just initialize the x and the h. Uh, instead of starting from R0, you start from something that's uh, pretty good uh, to, so that uh, it can converge faster as well as also converge to the global. Uh, solution. So the initialization is another innovation here that uh, tries to find the initial x as well as the h uh, using uh, another formula that's a sub, sub problem of operation here. So it forms this x matrix, uh, which I will define. And the, the raw over here is a function of the uh, channel impulse response, and in our case, we just choose the second norm of the H. Um, so the, again, the initialization matrix really is to say, if I have the pilot, I, I go from X1 and then pile, uh, form this matrix into this triangular form, and uh, each of the K is basically down here that we try to search for different uh, uh, x, uh, the next x basically in along the sequence. So the first seven x is the pilots. So we know we know the pilots already. So we don't really need to to search for it. So for the next one that is in the ID code, we we have the choice of minus one or one, and that becomes a tree. And along the tree that we have basically sixteen layers of those. And how do we really try to figure out which tree is the right one to start with? And, and the tree search solution really tries to uh, calculate a Euclidean distance as a metric and, and drop um, the ones that's, that's large and then keep, the, keep only four, the, four of the branches uh, that has lower Euclidean distance. And that way, the whole comp computational complexity uh, is lower. And again, you may not get to, to the optimal solution. And uh, that's just a starting point of our um, previous like L4 um, uh, 
optimization uh, starting point over there. So again, this particular pr procedure really helps with uh, the whole uh, algorithm to converge. Okay, let's get into the uh, results here. So some of the simulation results and the field data results as well. So when, when we use the simulation, we try um, generate the data uh, using the channel that is 15 um, samples in length or 31 samples in length and, and, and using the really fading model uh, or the, um, uh, the multi-pass model and uh, uh, tested out many different algorithms. Uh, now this particular bell curve basically shows, hey, if I have a, uh, a 15 um, channel lens, then I can perform a lot better with any of these algorithms. And the 31 bit channel uh, really um, needs very, very high SNR to perform okay-ish. Right? Um, and data processing, is actually pretty promising. So we, uh, uh, Susan actually looked into two data sets. One is the uh, tank test, 44 files uh, with, uh, with no ID code basically. So we know the ground truth. And there's also um, field experiments text. Um, I believe it's more than 2000 files. Um, these tags, we don't know exactly uh, which tag corresponding to what file, but we have a list of the tags. So the list has something like 11 to 13 tags in there. Uh, so if it's detected the code that's belonging to this list, that we say that's correct detection. If we our decision does not belong to that tag, then we say that's a false detection. So here is the result uh, with the raw detection without equalizer, without uh, decoding. Uh, this data can be only detected uh, uh, like 13%, 40, 48% in the, 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 the other group. And uh, adding the decoding using the CRC um, help a little bit. Um, uh, it's actually, um, adding more uh, over there. Um, and then using the CMA, which is a blind equalization plus decoding does not really help much. And other method does not help much either. And the, the new equalization plus, plus new decoding method actually doubles, uh, almost double the, the um, yeah, the tank text is more than double. And the field test is, um, uh, close to double the uh, performance. So we're pretty happy actually with, with this result. Although Susan was like, he, he wasn't really happy with, with the results, but uh, our PNL collaborators, they are pretty happy with the results. And uh, this, this is one of the example of uh, the tag code detection, as you can see, um, this is one of these tank tests and procedures of uh, detecting the, the baseband and the starting point and bucket code and then uh, followed by echoes and, and the uh, channel estimation plus uh, equalizer actually help to, to solve the tag ID properly. Uh, so uh, CRC example, as you can see that uh, algorithm one actually gives you um, uh, four of these very strong echoes and uh, um, algorithm two also give you four of the strong echoes. Again, you have only seven big bucket code. So the four, uh, four uh, strong echoes uh, can be identified properly. Uh, that's pretty reasonable. And that basically concludes my talk. So there's a, uh, uh, some conclusion over here. So what we, uh, this particular work we, in, we did is for a miniature underwater uh, IoT device, as you can see, very small. Um, 
this this difficult problem is formulated uh, in the underdetermined system identification problem, and we use something similar to compressive sensing as well as um, the L4 node uh, optimization. Um, uh, taking advantage of the uh, fact that uh, the symbols are all finite alphabet, meaning that if you use BPSK, it's only plus one and minus one. If you use QPSK, it's only like four uh, points on the constellation that uh, you need to um, uh, identify. Uh, so with exploring the sparsity of uh, transform um, uh, quantities, we actually be able to solve this problem very nicely. And theoretical analysis on this identifiability as well as the convergence um, are discussed in the in the journal paper. And we also did a lot of data processing again. Uh, but by the time that uh, Susan published the paper, the the amount of data processing was not really down as much. But uh, uh, later on, there's other students will actually uh, use um, millions of files basically available from PNL try to uh, really dig into the performance issues and, and maybe uh, look into other issues like uh, uh, when you have tag collide to each other or when you have the echo that uh, um, the data was recorded in two separate files and chopped and, and things like that. Uh, we can actually do a much better job there. And so if you're interested, uh, please look into the um, references and any questions are welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, so definitely all the attendees, uh, you can write a question on the Q&A panel or uh, Sahil can support us uh, essentially switching on the microphone of people who wants to ask any question. Actually, yes, I have a curiosity. So I guess that uh, this system essentially can be used both to monitor the behavior of the fishes, the physiology, and also, I guess, to monitor the environment, the underwater environment. I don't know, maybe you can tell us more um, about the applications you did and something you found, you find out maybe more surprising. Yeah. Uh, yes, very nice. Uh... Um, so the environmental aspect of the study was really done by PNL. Um, if you search this website, uh, the PNL um, people, they are mm, all hydrologists, civil engineering people. So they collaborate with a couple of companies as well as um, environmental group biologists. Um, they almost, this fish tag actually started developing from 2005. Uh, so it's more than more than 15 years of uh, trials. Um, so one thing that we were trying to ask them is to say, okay, you have 31 bits, why don't you transmit a little bit longer so that you can actually detect better, right? So right now their, their code can only detect something like 20 some percent. Uh, better case is only 40% 40 percent of the case and that becomes like half half efficiency so we we ask them to use a little bit longer bucket code for example and then stronger uh coding scheme and they say there's no way we can do the change right now because it's like 10 years of data out there in the field already and you just have to you just have to help us to to, to improve the performance over here so we just say, okay, then forget about how to redesign the tag itself and just focus on how to detect existing ones. Um, so what they actually do is uh, every time they, they try to study uh, how the water dams or the hydrodimes affect the migration of the salmon fish, basically. Um, and, and then uh, how many are dead and how many are alive and made it to their, uh, their migration uh, uh, path, basically. That's what they're, they're trying to study. And uh, 
uh, Daniel Den is the one that uh, really, uh, so if you, if you look into the last uh, reference paper, um, Daniel Den is the, the, the one who actually does many of this. So search his papers um, and many of the papers are also open source. So they have a lot of study. Every time they release um, many fish uh, injected with, with the tag and, and every year they probably do three, uh, three trials um, in actual water. Um, so all of the place in, um, in many, many rivers. Yeah, you're muted. <laughs> yeah, very, very interesting. Uh, yes, uh, maybe you said already, but I, I missed how many tags did you um, install, let's say, did you deploy so far? You know, uh, um, I guess uh, many tags, right? Um, yeah, the files, uh, um, they, uh, first of all, they, they wanted to have this algorithm run really, really fast uh, mm -hmm. because they have tons of data and any one trial can generate um, thousands of files. Mm -hmm. um, so, so they wanted to run fast. And uh, our algorithm so far is uh, pretty high uh, co computationally. And uh, um, every time they, they release hundreds of fish uh, mm -hmm. into, into the river with the tag. Right? I see. Cool. Yeah, every trial. And, and mm -hmm. uh, so for the ones that we got the data, they, they were early, early trials. And uh, the tag list that we are provided is something like uh, smaller ones, like 10 to 15 uh, tag IDs. And some are 30 tag IDs uh, in the list. So they know those are the ones that actually are possible in this, this particular trial. I see. Uh -huh. um, they also have a, a, a post-processing post-processing uh, uh, filter to say, hey, if I have a tag here and then after a few seconds, another tag. So within 20 seconds, I should be able to detect a few of those. And then they use that to, to identify the, the fish. The particular tag is still, is actually in, appeared at this location. Yeah. We haven't done, we haven't really done that part um, yet. <coughs> Again, mm -hmm. Susan has moved on to other other uh, fan, uh, uh, advanced algorithms like federated learning and things like that. So we, we got somebody else to, to continue this work. <laughs> I see. But very, very nice, great. And uh, the data essentially are transferred uh, online, I mean, uh, to satellites or how do you recollect the data? Or maybe they're uh, saved on board and you recollect uh, the tags? Yeah. They are not transmitted over the satellite because uh, PNL does not want to share those. Okay, so oh, okay. they are so the receivers are around here. The receiver uh -huh. device are actually pretty big, mm -hmm. uh, and they they record, they record and save, and and, uh, and once in a while they, they retrieve this this device and, and then save the data. Um, I, see. I was told one of our um, student uh, 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 Joseph, uh, he went to PNL doing um, the uh, internship. And they say they have room, big rack of hard drives with tons of data in there. <laughs> uh, so it's just mountains of data, basically. And, mm -hmm. and he was trying to also access and try to process some of this data. It takes days and days to really run. Great, uh, very nice. Let's see if, uh, yeah, I see a question from Osama. Um, so Osama is asking, does all tax transmit over the same band and how do you manage interference? 
Yeah, good question. Uh, yes, they are actually using the same bandwidth. And uh, um, so when they, when they have the fish tags, they are mostly the same kind. Uh, and then they're all transmitting at 400 some kilohertz. Um, again, there they are interference like this, right? Uh, like like the like this one, uh, like this one. Um, you can see that uh, this is a different tag, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, for this particular recording, it happens that the first one finish, and then the second one come in. But uh, in reality, sometimes you just have overlap. Um, and when that happens, then you have interference. Um, uh, there's basically no way to really, uh, or at least so far, we haven't really worked on this particular case. We just focus on this case and say, this one has itself uh, uh, a lot of echo, but we try to, we try to decode them, uh, assuming there's no interference. Uh, we also are looking into the case and say, okay, if you have some overlap, but we do know the first seven bits, uh, if you happen to only interfere seven bits, then can we actually help to uh, remove that interference? That's one thought. Uh, and then other thoughts basically is, how do you join the, jointly uh, optimize and, and, and search the solution? that's going to be a lot more challenging as well. Yeah, so right now the interference is not handled at all. Um, basically, if you have collision, then too bad. We just discard both if we cannot uh, detect them. Yeah. 